Hi students, this is Mrs. Foy, and today I'm going to be talking to you about ecosystems. This is chapter 55 in the Pearson AP um, edition, ninth edition. So an ecosystem is simply all the sum of all the organisms living in a particular area, including the abiotic components. So this is when we're going to start talking about the non-living nutrients. All that is part of the ecosystem. And an ecosystem can be a very vast um, area or it can be like a microcosm. So it just depends on, on um, what we're talking about. So this is a nice little concept map that kind of gives you an overall view of what we're going to be talking about today in this chapter. So one thing that I think is kind of cool um, about talking about ecosystems is that we get to talk about physics and chemistry. So the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry still apply to ecosystems in biology, right? So the laws of thermodynamics, right? You remember learning these, I'm sure. So the first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law of thermodynamics is that when energy is transformed, so you can't create energy and you can't destroy energy, but you can change its form. And when you change its form, some energy is lost um, usually in the form of heat, um, and that's the law of entropy. So ecosystems have to follow that rule when they have energy being transferred in a food web or food chain. And we also have to realize that ecosystems follow the conservation of mass. And remember from chemistry, the conservation of masses is, is that when you have the mass of reactants, after they go through a chemical reaction, the mass of those products has to be the same. So basically, this is a really important um, diagram that basically says two things. Energy cannot be recycled. Energy is a one-way flow on Earth from the sun through the um, food chain, but that chemicals, inorganic matter, is recycled. So here we have in red is our energy flow, and you guys have learned this before in biology, I'm sure. So we see that the flow of energy is from the sun to the primary producers. Now I should say this is um, showing the energy flow for the great um, majority of producers on Earth, but these would be photoautotrophs or photosynthetic autotrophs. This would not include the chemoautotrophs that are chemotrophs that use inorganic matter um, to um, as their source of energy to uh, to produce their food. So anyway, for, for the great majority of organisms, this is the energy pattern. So we have sun moving into the primary producers and then the primary consumers and secondary and tertiary. And notice, follow the red arrows. So every time we have an energy transfer, got to follow the laws of thermodynamics, some of this energy is lost in the form of heat in the transfer. And remember, these things can die, right? So a plant can die and a primary consumer can die. And that forms organic material called detritus. And that is when microorganisms and other detrivores are going to consume that. And then microorganisms and other detrivores are going to consume. Um, they, you can think of them as being the ultimate um, funnel of where this energy goes and then you see there's no more red arrows and that's because there's no more energy flow but the nutrients are recycled through all of the parts of um, the trophic levels and that's a very important point so um, we talk about something called primary production and when we talk about primary production in an ecosystem we are talking about the amount of light energy that is converted to chemical energy by photosynthetic autotrophs in a certain period of time. Okay, so what does that mean? What is chemical energy? That's glucose, right? So primary production is talking about the amount of light energy that is converted into glucose during photosynthesis. And we have a global energy budget. Um, most, the great majority of life on Earth is dependent upon how much solar energy gets to our Earth. And guess what? Only a small fraction of it actually gets to Earth because we have some of our solar energy, this light, this heat, this UV radiation, 
um, is going to be um, blocked, it's going to be reflected, it's going to be absorbed, but only a small percent, about 1% of the solar energy is going to hit photosynthetic organisms, plants. And of the light that hits there, only a small portion of that light is going to be of a usable wavelength for those plants. So you remember that light, in the big sense, is going to be the Roy G. Biv whole part of light, visible light, and that plants only absorb certain wavelengths of those, and you'll learn more about that when we learn about photosynthesis. So just like if you ever got a paycheck, you know that when you very first look at that paycheck, there is a big difference between your gross pay and your net pay. Your gross pay looks great, but then your net pay is what they is what you get after they take out taxes. And so gross primary production is the amount of glucose that is formed from photosynthesis minus, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, that's the amount that is formed. But then some of that energy, some of that glucose chemical energy is going to be used up in the respiration of the plant. So remember, plants don't just do photosynthesis. Plants photosynthesize and they respirate. And so the net, what is left over, the net primary production is what is left over um, to be laid down in new biomass. So you have your gross primary production, which is the amount of energy that is transferred into chemical energy, which is glucose, the amount of glucose produced, and the respiration is what the plant then uses to be able to respirate and produce ATPs for itself, and the leftover glucose is then going to be used to make materials that the plant is made of, to make new biomass the plant is growing, and that is called the net primary production. So net primary production can be expressed either as the amount of energy per unit, so you can talk about the amount of energy in that glucose per meter squared times the year, or it can be thought of as the biomass, the amount of biomass that that plant um, assimilates into itself, which would be grams per meter squared per year. So if you see any of those um, units, then you know we're talking about the NPP. Um, and what's important is that the NPP is what is available to the next tier on the food chain. That's what's going to be available to the consumers. And we talk about the standing crop of the earth or in an ecosystem as being the amount of biomass of the photosynthetic autotrophs at any given time. And the NPP um, is going to vary greatly depending on where you are in the, in the earth. So you can see here is our net primary production and you can see that the most productive places on Earth, guys, not surprisingly, are the tropical rainforest, right? The tropical rainforests are extremely productive. So we also have something called the net ecosystem production. And that is going to be the amount of energy that is assimilated um, in a given period um, and, and that's going to be minus the respiration of all the organisms in that ecosystem. So one of the things that, um, that we need to think about um, that is review for most of you is that when an organism photosynthesizes, they are taking in carbon dioxide, right? They're taking in carbon dioxide and together with water, they are producing glucose and giving off oxygen as a byproduct. So it's actually kind of hard to figure out how much of that CO2 goes into the glucose. So when you see oxygen being released by an ecosystem, that's an indication that photosynthesis is occurring. And this storing glucose, well, glucose is stored in, excuse me, this storing carbon dioxide means that glucose is being produced. So the release of oxygen is an indication that um, photosynthesis is happening and carbon dioxide is being um, assimilated, transferred into glucose. So it's actually kind of hard to do that in aquatic systems. And this is just um, a slide from Pearson textbook to kind of show you um, how scientists can figure out um, how much oxygen is in the water. And when we do our dissolved oxygen lab, we're going to see that that gives us an indication of 
the productivity of water by how much oxygen is being produced. So the primary productivity in aquatic systems is going to be a function of two things. How much light gets through the water and how, many, how much nutrients are available. So we have this layer up at the top of the water that's called the photic zone. And that is the um, area, the depth of the water where sunlight can penetrate. And down in the deeper areas, not as much sunlight can penetrate, and so we don't have photosynthesis going on there. We might have chemosynthetic autotrophs down there, but we don't have photosynthetic autotrophs down there. And so one uh, thing that we need for photosynthesis to occur is light, but we also need nutrients. And what we find um, in aquatic systems is that the nutrients are down in the bottom. They're down in the deep, colder water. And so in order for photosynthesis to occur with those phytoplankton, those algae, we need to have upwellings of the nutrients. We need to basically have a mixing of the nutrients from the deep water down, at, um, down from the deep water up into the shallow water where the photic zone is. Um, and we know that upwelling of nutrients causes, is caused by wind turning over the water and also by different temperatures of water that causes the um, water to turn over. And this is going to be in ocean water and also in fresh water. So I just talked about the fact that the light is limited by the depth and we talked about these nutrients. Now, what is very interesting about nutrients is you think, okay, well, how do animals get nutrients? Well, we get nutrients by eating our food. How do plants get nutrients, right? They don't eat their food. They make their food. And so plants need nutrients to be able to um, make all of the uh, chemicals that they need to be able to survive. And nitrogen and phosphorus are two of the very important nutrients that plants need. They also need potassium. They need nitrogen because nitrogen is one of the major elements in things like DNA and proteins and hormones and things like that. And phosphorus, we know that phosphorus is um, one of the major components in cell membranes, right? And phospholipids. And of course, all um, plants are going to need both of those two things. So um, some scientists did some experiments to see which one was the limiting nutrient in a bunch of phytoplankton off the coast of... Um, of New York, and they found in this experiment that the greater phytoplankton density was directly related to how much ammonium was enriched in that water. Now, ammonium is a polyatomic ion NH4+, and so that is the nitrogen source um, for these aquatic organisms was ammonium. And so you can see by this graph here that it was the nitrogen that was the limiting reactant because the more nitrogen that was added we can see that there was more phytoplankton um, that was produced. Nitrogen and phosphorus are not always the limiting nutrients. Organisms like plants also need iron and so there was another study done that in the uh, Sargasso Sea in the subtropic Atlantic that showed that Iron was the limiting nutrient in, those, in that particular ecosystem. So I just think this, um, this study is very ingenious. So, so in your controls, there were no nutrients added, right? And this relative uptake of C14 by cultures, you know that C14 is a radioactive um, isotope of carbon that can be measured. And the uptake means that it's producing glucose, right? It's taking carbon dioxide and it's um, producing glucose. So in the controls, you can see that the relative uptake was about one. When nitrogen and phosphorus were added, it was about still one. And where nitrogen, phosphorus, and other metals, not including iron, were added, we still have about one. But when nitrogen, phosphorus, and metals were added that included iron, we jumped way up to 12.90. That plant was really photosynthesizing and really producing glucose. And then here, just adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and iron, we have almost matching um, amounts of C14 being uptaken by the culture. So that was an ingenious experimental design, I think, to show that iron happened to be the limiting reactant for that ecosystem in the Sargasso Sea. Well, when we talk about terrestrial production, now we're talking about 
plants photosynthesizing on land. And again, soil nutrient is most often the limiting um, factor in the primary production of plants. And most often it is nitrogen. But phosphorus can also be a limiting nutrient, especially in older soils. Well, guess what? What are the two major ingredients in fertilizer? Nitrogen and phosphorus, and also potassium to a certain extent. And so one of the things that we have learned as humans um, is that other than adding fertilizer, there are more natural ways that we can get nutrients into plants. And one of the things that we know about plants uptaking nitrogen is that some plants will form mutualistic relationships with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And this, these are plants in the legume family, things like clover, things like soybeans, will actually in their roots have a little colony of bacteria that are nitrogen fixing. So they will take nitrogen from the air and they will put it in the form that the plant can use, which is um, either NH3 or NH4. Other plants are going to form a mutualistic relationship with some different types of fungi. And these fungi are going to get nutrients from the plants, but then the fungi support the plants by providing phosphorus and other elements for those plants. We, we see that root hairs um, on roots are going to increase the surface area for production, and uh, some plants also have enzymes that increase the availability of their nutrients. So let's take a look at the amount of plant material that is now going to be available to another trophic level. So here we have a nice, beautiful, juicy caterpillar eating a leaf. And we can see that the plant material eaten by the, cow, by the caterpillar is um, about 200 joules. Well, what happens to those 200 joules of energy? Well, 67 of them are going to be utilized for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration of the caterpillar. So see, now we're talking about consumers. So the caterpillar is going to eat this plant material, and now it's going to do respiration to convert those glucose into CO2. Some of the energy is going to go toward new growth. We call this secondary production. So primary production is what the plants produce. Now this is a consumer, so this is secondary production. So this is going to be actual energy that gets transformed into building new cells and materials in the caterpillar. And then 100 joules of that, look, about 50% of that energy goes out of species. It's not assimilated at all. It is undigested, goes right through the digestive tract of that animal. And so we can look at animals and we can talk about things called production efficiency. And the production efficiency is going to be equal to the net secondary production. So remember the net secondary production was the amount of new biomass that the caterpillar um, produced by eating the leaf divided by the assimilation of the primary production. Okay, so what was assimilated? What part of the plant material was assimilated? Well, all the energy that was used for respiration and all the energy that was used for secondary growth. Um, and so we know that different organisms have different efficiencies. Birds and mammals are not very efficient. Um, and that is because it takes a lot of energy to maintain our internal temperature based on what is around us. So endothermy, being endotherms, being warm-blooded, as you will, costs a lot of energy. So we're not very efficient. Fish have a, a production efficiency of about 10%, but insects and microorganisms are, have an efficiency of about 40 or more percent. So when you look at the trophic efficiency, now we're talking about the percentage of the production that is transferred to the next highest trophic level. Usually the rule of thumb is it's about a 10% transfer, although it can range from 5 to 20% depending on the ecosystem. And that trophic efficiency is multiplied over the link. Remember, every time you have an energy transfer, you have some of that energy that is going to be wasted as heat um, because of the laws of the thermodynamics. And so because of that, and because of the energy that is assimilated, you have very little energy at the very top that is left over for the tertiary consumers. And so um, we get trophic levels, um, trophic energy 
pyramids. We usually have a much broader um, base of the producers and we get smaller and smaller as we go up. And you can see this is like a textbook example of the 10% rule. Um, and so normally we see biomass period pyramids showing a sharp decrease at each higher trophic level. But there are some ecosystems where that is not the case. So for example, looking at this aquatic ecosystem from the English Channel, you can see that there is a very small biomass of phytoplankton that is supporting a much larger biomass of zooplankton. But because of the flow of the energy in ecosystems, it does have a very important take-home message for the human population. When you eat meat, it is a much less efficient way of utilizing energy in our ecosystem than if you ate plants. And you can see that because of the levels of the trophic um, levels of our ecosystem. And so um, as we have 7 billion humans now and we are working on we're still in that J curve of the human population. Uh, we need to think about the most efficient way to feed all of the humans on the earth. And if we all ate plant material, it would be a lot more efficient. So now we're going to talk about the abiotic factors of ecosystems. So remember, ecosystems are all the organisms in a particular area and the abiotic. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the abiotic. And we, can, we know that nutrients recycle, right? Energy, do, energy does not recycle, but nutrients do recycle. And so carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen, um, and water are going to be involved in cycling. In general, um, the cycling of nutrients follows the same pattern. So you have a reservoir in organic materials that are easily available. You have some of this material that gets fossilized. And so that is unavailable unless that fossil fuels uh, end up being burned and now these things go back into the atmosphere where they can be assimilated. Now we're talking more specifically about carbon. And some of this material ends up being kind of trapped in inorganic materials such as rocks and minerals where it is unavailable unless it is weathered or eroded back into the water where it can get back into the cycle again. So um, I'm going to stop my lecture right now, even though you can see there are several slides left in this lecture for my students. And um, I would like for you to please go over these slides um, yourself. I think most of them will be review. And um, get the basics of the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle, and the water cycle. So see you in class. Thanks.